Monsieur le Président. President, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, it's a great honour for me to be addressing the Human Rights Council. The work carried out by this august council, whose noble goals are engraved in the UN Charter, fully, res fully merit the respect of us all. President, I have no lessons to share other than that which Cambodia itself has learned. And our country today finds itself at a crossroads of regrettably contradictory perceptions. Many see Cambodia as a success story of a country devastated by war and genocide, a country which got back on its feet, reconciled, and carried out enormous economic and social reforms. Sadly, some wish to see in my country only the shortcomings in values of a di democracy that they demand be perfect, an exemplary democracy that even the countries who criticize us cannot achieve. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the end of the genocidal regime of Pol Pot. For us, it's an opportunity to recall and remind the whole world where we come from. After almost four years of power, this regime left over two million people dead of the seven million people who lived in 1975. The victims belonged chiefly to the so-called citadine population, in other words, the most educated class. Cambodia in 1979 was a country devastated, without roads, bridges, schools, without hospitals, without administrative services, without currency, without religion, without a state. It was a it's a people of traumatized survivors, exhausted, which has suffered several deportations and s was stripped of everything. This people of survivors, that a majority in the UN would inflict a complete embargo on, and, which, and they, would let, uh, they would leave the country's butchers occupy once again the seats of power in Cambodia. Governments who speak all the time of democracy and human rights have denied a whole survivor's people, people who survived the worst tragedy of the century, of the right, they've stripped them of the right to food, health care, education, housing, work, development and even peace. And that in the space of 12 years. That's where we come from. Now, while today Cambodia has become a lower middle-income country, that's in great part thanks to the peace achieved by the win-win policy of national reconciliation of our Prime Minister. Five years after the withdrawal of the UN Provisional Authority, throughout these years of reconstruction, the right to food, the right to health, the right to education, to culture, to housing, to work as prescribed by the Universal Human Rights Declaration of 1948 have always been a, the priority of priorities of our government. All international entities recognize the considerable progress achieved in these spheres. We have an annual growth rate exceeding 7% and have, done, and have had that for the last 20 years, making Cambodia the sixth fastest growing country in the world. We have a poverty rate reduced to less than 10%, a, school, a primary school enrollment rate of 98%. Life expectancy has gone from 54 years in 1993 to 69 in 2016. Cambodia has managed to achieve the majority of the MDGs ahead of schedule. Having been a host country to Blue Helmets, Cambodia is now a troop contributing country to United Nations peacekeeping missions, providing close to 6,000 soldiers in eight countries in Africa and the Middle East since 2006. Alas, this progress and many other advances of very little highlighted in the reports that brought before you and as a result our government continues to be very unfairly treated on the basis of biased prejudiced information which fuels criticism against us in terms of bias we should note that the reports that criticize the government have very rarely condemned the practices of a political opposition which violates the values at the heart of democracy and human rights. 
defamation, grave defamation and slander of leaders, systematic calls to racial hatred and to xenophobia, production of falsified documents, provocations jeopardizing relations with a neighboring state, delegitimation of institutions, repeated calls to sedition by the armed forces, which maintaining in so doing a permanent climate of civil war grave violations of legislative provisions which are identical to those that exist in the Western countries aren't even noted, such as, for example, violation of the ban on foreign financing of political parties, violation of the law on association, refusal to respect codes drafted with the assistance of Western universities. These reports continue to qualify decisions by the justice system as being politically motivated. When judgments handed down on the same cases and the same circumstances handed down by Western courts produce the same decisions. That is how we are being treated. Now I'd like to touch on a certain number of provisions of the Universal Human Rights Declaration and explain how they are respected in Cambodia. Now, while so many countries have been torn apart by religious conflict, religious freedom and tolerance between the different faiths is an everyday reality in our country. The various Christian, the, the various sensi Christian sensibilities and that of the very vibrant Muslim minority are present and are respected in terms of freedom of expression and opinion once again. It's a caricature that is projected abroad. There are many opposition newspapers, both in Khmer, in Khmer and in English. Uh, bookshops can, in full liberty, sell ex books that are sometimes extremely aggressive towards the leaders of the country. Certain radio, radio stations, both local and foreign, uh, air partisan information on an everyday basis. Access to social networks is completely free throughout the country. Uh, equality before taxpayer respect for ethical rules are legal constraints in Cambodia as they are in the Western countries. But Western criticism seems to be without limit. On behalf of freedom of expression, some even go so far as to reproach us for protecting the inviolability of our sovereign. When a leader publicly declares that he and his party are financed and receive technical assistance from a foreign power to illegally topple the legitimately and democratically elected government, we do take steps necessary to protect the institution's peace and stability of our country. The representative of Australia said during this session last year that he said is fundamental to ensuring all are equal before our system of justice. And that is indeed the principle that we apply. Today, having taken these protective measures, we are endeavoring in negotiating with those who are ready to accept a peaceful democracy to find a way of reconciling democracy and political stability, political pluralism, and public peace. To that end, we have taken legal decisions enabling 118 officials from the former opposition party to be fully integrated into political life. The government has just set up a dialogue structure with civil society and I have personally opened on 29th January a dialogue that we wish that we trust will be regular with foreign NGOs. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a few months ago we extended by two years the mandate of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Phnom Penh, making Cambodia the only country in Asia to host such a structure on its territory. We continue to host visits to receive the recommendations from the Special Rapporteur. Just last month, a Cambodian delegation participated in the Universal Periodic Review. 
and informed the Council of specific measures taken by our government to bolster democracy, human rights and the rule of law. I would like to reiterate here the gratitude of our delegation to those countries who in good faith submitted their comments and recommendations. I would simply like to conclude by repeating that what our Prime Minister Samdik Tekohun Sen told Madame Michelle Bachelet, the High Commission of Human Rights, very recently. He said that Cambodia was determined to promote democracy, human rights and the rule of law, but also to protect the so hard-won, so valuable peace that we have for a people that, of whose, whose past whose tragic past you know all too well. In conclusion, I wish you all the very best of success. I thank you. Excellency, thank you for your statement. Uh,